session of business as usual. I'm Audrey Russo, President and CEO of the Pittsburgh Technology Council, and I am joined today by my co-host, Jonathan Kirsting, who's also Vice President of Visibility at the Tech Council. These are really unusual times, but at the Tech Council, we're here to do what we always do. And two things that we normally do is connect our members to the innovators and technologists that are driving Pittsburgh's technology economy and connect our members with influential public policy leaders. So today we have a special double header where we will be doing both of those things. So who's up first is Francois Estelon, who serves as the chief technology officer and chief operating officer of SGK, which is a Matthews International company, who will be then closely followed by Senator Jay Costa, who will be fresh off the Senate floor from passing two major relief packages. So a couple of things about today's call. First of all, it would not have been possible without the strong support of our good friends at Huntington Bank, who stepped up to sponsor this series. If you don't know anything about Huntington, they're actually the largest SBA lender here in Southwestern Pennsylvania. And if you were on yesterday's call with the SBA, that their um, organizations like Huntington Bank are going to be playing even more crucial and pivotal roles in getting cash to small businesses. And I also want to thank the team at AT&T for sponsoring our ongoing public policy series. They have been a long-standing partner of ours, and I particularly want to commend their team for their company's recent $10 million donation to help give parents, students, and teachers the tools they will need for an at-home learning environment. So just a little bit about the technology and the format for today's call. Most of you will notice that you have, we have muted your microphones. I would ask that you keep your microphones on mute throughout the call. Some of us have a lot of background noise going on around us and we want to ensure that everyone can hear our guests clearly. So with that said, we want the call to be interactive. Take note of the chat box at the bottom of your desktop screens. If you have any questions for our guest, just type your question in that box along with your name and company. We will try to answer as many of these questions as possible. And please do not use the box for anything other than questions. This is not a place for advertising or promotions. So without further delay, I would like to jump in and welcome today's first guest, Francois Estelon. He is the CTO and COO of SGK. Matthews International Company, and many of you on this call will know. We're going to learn about SGK today. Francois previously served as the Chief Information Officer of Gardner Denver, another storied Pittsburgh company, which was engaged in the manufacturing sector. He also is a current board member of the Pittsburgh Technology Council. So welcome, Francois. Thank you, Audrey. Glad to be here so much for joining us. So Francois, Matthews International is a brand familiar to most people in Pittsburgh, but can you share a little bit about the SGK story and maybe just take a few minutes to provide an overview of your core services and tell us about how Pittsburgh plays into this strategy? Okay, absolutely, thank you. So um, SGK is, is a division of Matthews, as you, as you mentioned before. Um, we are roughly around 6,000 employees worldwide uh, and revenue in excess of uh, $800 million uh, globally. And, and what we do, uh, we activate brands. So we, we create and deliver brand and globally and at scale uh, for the world largest and, and most recognized brands in uh, food and beverage, in, in consumer goods, retail, electronics, uh, pharmaceuticals. You, you take uh, any Fortune 50 in, in those verticals and, and we do some work for them uh, globally. We are in over 60 countries, uh, delivering brand in over 120 countries, um, over 40 locations around the world, but Pittsburgh is our headquarter. Um, and it's also the, uh, the headquarter of one of our uh, division called IDL, 
uh, in East Butler, uh, Pennsylvania, at Bakery Square, and now at the soft side, where um, I deal those a lot of experiential marketing for local companies as well as global companies. But uh, Giant Eagle uh, Sheets, uh, the new uh, new design of their uh, food store, uh, Dick Sporting Goods, and and so on and so forth. So so to explain what we exist. Uh, marketing in large uh, CPG companies is a, a, a very messy business. Uh, it's very siloed. You have brand, you have marketing channels, uh, you know, retail store, uh, online presence, uh, social media. Uh, also, if you're a large brand, you're, you're usually in, in multiple regions, multiple countries, languages. And so a, a single large uh, consumer product good companies may have thousands and thousands of ad agencies, uh, employees, and uh, many stakeholders from, from printers to, uh, to online presence. And so everything is really messy. And so what we do at scale is we're, we're, we're taking all this mess and, and basically organizing it uh, for our customers and, and delivering their, their, their brand content uh, from the shelf in the store to 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 the e-commerce in in a, in a very seamless way and, and and creating consistency across the brand uh, around the world. Uh, so our services uh, we do creation, uh, consultancy creation. We create content for online presence. We create packaging design uh, and and customer experience. And and we deliver those services uh, you know either digitally through through files, but also we manufacture uh, the tooling required to go and print some of those uh, those artifacts marketing artifacts so we we deliver plates and cylinder for the for the printing industry um, so that's that's a very high level what we do as, a, as an organization so that that's great appreciate you sort of setting the table for us to understand recently though you felt the impact early on of covid19 and particularly because of your global nature and also because of the cancellation of many events. So we're looking to hear about, about that. What can you share about how that has affected Matthews and SGK? No, absolutely. So, so you have to think that we're, we're a people-based business. Uh, our supply chain is, is our 6,000 employees and few hundreds of contractors and, 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 and suppliers of, of people around the world. And when people get sick, when people are quarantined, uh, our supply chain is, is obviously very, very distressed. Uh, for us, it started back in China. Uh, we have over uh, 500, 600 employees in China across uh, multiple locations. We serve uh, the local uh, uh, Chinese retail market as well as some of our brand in the APAC region. And, and we got hit really hard and really quickly uh, with the, uh, the, the first measures that the Chinese government took uh, and we had to learn really quickly to work in a remote fashion um, and also in an environment that, as you know, is, is a little challenging from an infrastructure and, and, and communication standpoint. Uh, so we had to learn really quickly uh, with close really fast, very limited notice from, from the local governments and still serve our clients. Uh, because while the activity in China uh, drastically dropped, the rest of APAC was still humming at the time. And so now you know, 85 days after this, this first uh, closure, it is global for now. Um, all our location around the world are pretty much work from home. We've been able to move 90% of our workforce uh, in a remote work environment and, and still deliver for our clients. And, and so it's across all of the US, all across uh, UK, Germany, um, Malaysia, and India, most lately uh, with the announcement from Prime Minister Modi over the weekend. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's been really, really challenging, uh, but we learn a lot. Uh, I think what we're learning is, uh, you know, infrastructure that is given in some countries like the U.S., working from home is not a, a big issue. Uh, when you get into other environments, uh, Malaysia, um, China, as we talked about, India, uh, it is, it is, we're relying heavily on infrastructure that may not be sized or maybe not be designed appropriately. Uh, the government landscape uh, make it very challenging, uh, again, depending on which country you're in. Uh, if I think about India, for example, uh, we went into last weekend uh, preparing from a work from home situation, thinking it would be a couple of days away. Then uh, the Indian government announced uh, a day of um, stay at home on Sunday, 
which within an hour or two was extended until Monday morning, which was then extended to a stay at home shelter in place order like we have in the US and uh, uh, in the UK to then a complete lockdown of the city and all that within 12 hours. Uh, so we have struggled, uh, obviously, with that in order to get, uh, you know, over 600 people that we have in, in India working from home and, and uh, you know, getting them the, the broadband internet that they need because it's not as common over there than it is in, in, in our in, in, um, Western countries, getting in the devices and getting everything. So we're doing our maximum, but it's, uh, I think that every local government, uh, you know, their own rules, their own timeline, and that's been, uh, that's been very, very um, interesting to say the least. From a market landscape, uh, I think we're seeing really two different trends. Um, a lot of what we call our experiential business, which is really where brands interact with the consumer either in a store or in a retail environment, that has dropped drastically over the last two or three weeks to almost uh, not that much. Uh, cancellation of fairs, events like Soft by Southwest, those kind of things are already impending. Um, you know, impacting short term that experiential business. Um, on our general marketing, uh, I think we haven't seen it yet, but we're expecting uh, some of the large events like the Olympics uh, that have been postponed, where brands usually launches you know new brand of cereals, Olympics the sponsors, where we're expecting to see a, a long term impact maybe on our business. I would say, however, that on short term. Uh, our packaging business uh, has been, you know, staying pretty, uh, pretty up and running. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, opportunities, uh, brands that want to uh, enter new market with, with, with uh, sanitation and, and soap and hand sanitizer, retail store. And, and we're part of the, the strategic supply chain for, for consumer goods and pharma goods where, where, you know, it's a rush to get everything on the shelf right now. Okay. Do we have any questions, Jonathan, from the from the chat yet? Not yet, but I've got a ton of questions. Yeah. And I mean, Francois, with you being the <laughs> CEO of the company, I mean, the pressure must have been on in order to get your staff to, to work remotely and all the different conditions you were just telling us about. What were some mm -hmm. of the key challenges that it took in order to get that to happen? And then how'd you take some of that and then bring it to the States here as it started to hit us here? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that uh, we realize is that the Chinese supply chain being impacted has downstream effect. So you want people to work from home. Uh, the way we work from home is through uh, remote access because our, our graphics file are really large. So you can't really, you know, move them across the wires uh, easily. Uh, for that, we had to supply our employees that didn't have devices with things like Google Chrome and Android devices and things like this, which are in rare supply. I was going to say. Uh, because the Chinese supply chain was uh, completely, um, you know, just in time and things like this was completely shut down for two months. Uh, and then everybody else is scrambling at the same time uh, to get the people to work from home in, in the same situation. So uh, uh, supply of devices has been pretty critical, I would say, over the internet bandwidth and, and everybody working from home and the load on the bandwidth. Uh, see European countries have had, you know, people like Netflix to stop streaming in Ultra HD. Uh, so so that these have been some of the, the challenges. Uh, and then also obviously keeping tab on, you know, our 6,000 employees, making sure they're healthy, making sure they are safe at home, making sure their family are taken care of. Uh, which is, you know, obviously very important in 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 in, in a people-based business and, and part of our, our values at Matthews and SGK. So, uh, yeah, a lot of conference calls, a lot of uh, late and early morning to get uh, maybe more in touch with our Asian uh, and European colleagues than, than we used to. How about on the cybersecurity side of things? Obviously, with all these devices and everyone logging in, keeping security must be insane. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. We we, we have luck that we have a very strong uh, technology department within Matthews and as part of, you know, the, the, the value of an SGK as a division of Matthews is we, we reach the, uh, you know, the capability of uh, almost $2 billion company. So we, we do have the privilege to have access to the, the right people and the right equipment. Uh, what we've seen, though, is, is, is an increase and, and we're communicating really hard with our employees of, of phishing attempt and you know, using um, any any type of COVID-19 headline to get people to click on the wrong link and stuff like this. So, so we haven't seen an increase in, in activity, I would say, on, on a normal basis of, of attack or stuff like this. But 
what we're seeing in the is a phishing increase across across the organization. So, so Francois, on our call yesterday with Speaker Mike Terzai, he asked us to help the Commonwealth identify companies and organizations who could temporarily respond or repurpose some of their resources to manufacture essential safety supplies and medical devices. Mm -hmm. And SGK is actually doing that. And can you share about what's happening right here in Butler, Pennsylvania? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, yes, our, our Butler facility uh, is where our experiential uh, business is, 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 uh, is coming out. So, so we have a, a lot of very talented uh, fabricators uh, and, and tools and, and, and space to manufacture. So, so we, we will build, you know, store displays, we'll build, uh, uh, um, you know, complete pop-up store for, 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 for some of the events. So we, we have the capabilities and the capacity. So we've already partnered with a, a uh, plastic distributor and in combination of their design and our design, we are ramping up manufacturing of uh, face shields. Uh, we believe that within a couple of days we can we can output around seventy five thousand face shields a day uh, to deliver to the to the healthcare community and and the first line responders. Uh, we're also looking at producing uh, other applications for our retail customers, like uh, like shielding uh, for for cashiers and what you're starting to see on the news. Uh, we're looking at uh, also manufacturing uh, things like stickers. Uh, to put in retail store to maintain the safe six feet distance between with, between people when queuing. Uh, so we're, we're ramping up. So, so basically what happened is we, over the last 10 days, there's been a big pivot in that team is first as a non-essential business following the, uh, the, the direction of, of uh, Governor Wolf, uh, we were planning to close our, our, our facility. And then we started to think, oh, we can help the community. Uh, or we can keep our employee uh, working uh, in, in safe conditions. So we have implemented a lot of uh, health and safety, uh, protective equipment and cleaning of the facility, uh, but maintaining the livelihood of our employees and providing for their families and, and recognizing the need in the community. So that's where we started to look at what can we do and our fabrication experience is where we say, okay, we can, we can do things in the healthcare space, especially on plastics and, 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 and manufacturing. And that's so all we, we've started to partner with a distributor of plastics that we're looking for, for partners with the design, but because we have designers, we have engineers, uh, we're starting to build our own designs as well. And, and we're, we're planning to ramp up. Uh, so in, in East Butler, um, and, and, and this business also has um, operation in Portland, Oregon. So we're also ramping up over there to help uh, Washington states and Oregon and California. And so you also are talking about your need for skills, just overall in SDK. Can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as I said, um, because of the critical role of packaging in the supply chain to get product on the shelf, uh, a lot of our clients are actually increasing demand, trying to get uh, products to market with um, additional branding. Uh, to make sure that people understand which products, like for example, in sanitizing, like which one are efficient against the virus, which one are not. Uh, we're also seeing a trend where you know reusable um, reusable packaging is 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 a is a big no no right now because you don't want to reuse something that has, could have been contaminated. So single use packaging is is growing really quickly, and and brands are trying to get this to market to support uh, the consumers. And so we have uh, we have posted it's on LinkedIn, um, and if you go to sgk.com, you'll be able to get the link. We're hiring uh, fifty at least fifty people in the U.S. Uh, on the flex force uh, environment, so work from home. Uh, we have all the the work and all the system and technology ready. We just need the device. You just need to have your own device. Uh, to do uh, production artwork, so looking for people with creative background, uh, brand background, um, experience with like Adobe Illustrator, Photoshop. Uh, we're looking for uh, color retouching. Uh, we're looking for customer service representative in order to help our customer to manage their projects. Uh, quality check in the graphic and digital space. So uh, I encourage anybody who is uh, looking for work right now. And it's a flex for, so it's based on projects. It's it's make your own time. Uh, so uh, yep, look on LinkedIn, um, on SGK. Look at my profile; it's linked there as well. And feel free to apply. Um, and I think we're gonna need more of that as 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 the demand continues. Absolutely. 
So what a great example of a pivot, right? So, and yeah. you know, this large multi-country um, responsibilities that you have in terms of pivot. What about in terms of distribution and manufacturing? Can you talk about that in terms of- your Sorry, I did a, you broke it up a little bit. Uh, would you mind- Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, in terms of uh, looking for help in distribution, are you looking for help in, in that area as well? Uh, not too much. Our, our main thing right now is the only people that are working uh, in an office for us right now is uh, our printing and plate business, uh, which is under the CISA uh, classification, is, a, is, an, is an essential critical infrastructure uh, because without the plates, you can print the package. Without the package, you can put product on the shelf. Uh, so there we were. We've been working, uh, you know, uh, decreasing the number of shift uh, people per shift been cleaning up machines uh, and trying to, to, to make uh, as safe as an environment as possible for our employees. Okay, let me see if there's any questions out there. Jonathan, do you see any questions? Yeah, I think a lot of people are curious about the post COVID-19 when we get to that day, which we're very excited about. Like, how do you see the company moving forward? Do you see you growing, shrinking, um, obviously reacting differently to how, how things happen? Absolutely, and, and and we're starting to see some um, you know some trends in our, our client demand. Even you know with two months of experience from coming from Asia to Europe to the US, um, the the adoption of e-commerce uh, you know is 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 huge. I mean, we 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 know e-commerce was big. It's been a big part of a transition of our business where we're getting more and more demand for services like photography to be able to put product in the right lights on, on, on the website, uh, CGI and 3D renders of products, uh, again, for, for online presence, for social, for, uh, for, for different e-commerce platform. And, and I think with the isolation and the quarantine, uh, we're likely to see, uh, you know, an exponential growth in where people, uh, all people shop. So people that were resisting the, the e-commerce or, for many reasons, uh, or, or not not interested, no, don't have a choice, and, and so I think we're we're going to see a, a trend of of additional e-commerce pattern uh, in the future, and I think it's going to be really difficult to come back to before. Know that you know for a period of extended period of time, most likely, uh, people will be uh, will be shopping online. Um, I think we're seeing two other trends. Uh, one of them is is strategic prioritization on brands. Uh, you know, the, 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 some of the brands we're talking to are, are already looking at their portfolio of, of products and, and making sure that they're focusing on the right thing in the short term. And then there is a, something that we, we don't know in the long term, but it's, it's, it's what I was talking about earlier is, is that sustainability impact. You know, over the last two or three years, we've seen a lot of consumer behavior going to you know, eco-friendly packaging, uh, multi-use packaging, uh, you know, Starbucks giving you a cup and, you know, you refill it so you don't have to, to waste, uh, you know, paper cups. And then suddenly we're going completely in the opposite direction with right. single-use packaging. And so this is going to be interesting. Uh, you know, we already have New York State as, as, uh, as part of their crisis has completely suspended their sustainability initiatives and, and regulations. And a lot of chains like Starbucks and Whole Foods have had its single-use cup. So, so is that going to land after the, the crisis is, is yet to be seen. Uh, but, you know, I mean, sustainability and environmental concerns are long-term challenges as well. And, and we need to make sure that um, we find the right balance between the short-term risk that we have today and, and, and the long-term uh, sustainability impact to the planet. It's crazy stuff all the way around. So we might be back to plastic bags at grocery stores again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's insane. Right. So many governments have ordered non-essential businesses to shut down. And you have been somewhat impacted, but not completely impacted. Um, looking to hear a little bit about SGK as an essential part of the supply chain, particularly yeah. as you mentioned with the packaging industry. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we, as interestingly enough, as, as we, every, especially in the States, uh, as the different governors and, and local jurisdiction were taking, uh, you know, shelter in place and essential business initiative, uh, we received dozens of letters from our clients, um, you know, justifying our existence as a company uh, and opening the business as, as a critical supplier to them. Um, if you think about it, 
if you don't have packaging, if you can't print a package, you can put product on the shelf. Um, you know, some, especially in, in areas that are highly regulated, like pharma, uh, you know, some food and beverage, um, you know, you, you can't just put products, it's, it's, it's not possible. So, so that's why um, a lot of the work we're doing is considered essential infrastructure. Uh, because if I can't deliver a plate to a printer, we can't make packaging and we can't have product on the shelf. Right. So it's been remarkable. It's remarkable what you're doing. I know you're running around the clock. So I just want to make sure that we recap that you actually really are hiring right now. And yes, we are. And that hiring actually is facilitated through work from home. And you've been yes. able to, to master that. So did you, um, someone's asking if you actually applied for a waiver to, do you know anything about those waivers? To operate Sorry, I didn't hear the, as an essential business? So we, uh, we have not had to apply for waivers uh, because we are qualified under the Federal uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency uh, mandate, uh, CISA. Uh, as a as a identified essential critical infrastructure, so we we do not have to apply for waivers because most of the government uh, in PA in Georgia where we operate the printing shop uh, in Toronto in Canada we we are uh, directly under those uh, those exemption already. So any we also had a question here about any strategies or tactics that you'd be willing to share in terms of. Um, addressing stress on the job working from home and all these changes mm -hmm. and the remarkable pivot that you've done uh, i would say personally praise your kids teachers <laughs> they have a lot of patience <laughs> <laughs> and you don't realize that you're, you're stuck since 10 days uh with a nine and an 11 year old that climbing up the walls right now uh no i mean um I think, uh, yes, we have to think, especially in a people-based business like us, we have to think of our employees. Uh, communication, uh, you know, over-communicating, uh, clarity and, and transparency is huge. Um, we have, uh, you know, different, different, of, different teams in our group that have, have experience on different things. Uh, you know, we're, uh, you know, personally, we've recommended everybody to take a, uh, you know, only two doses of news a day. If you need to, 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the evening, otherwise shut down your, your feed. Don't watch CNN. Day yeah. and day. I like uh, that. Yeah, yeah, surely. <laughs> the, and, 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 you know, um, we got a, I got an email from my, my, my doctor, Dr. Andy, uh, and he said, you know, stress is releasing cortisol, cortisol deprives the immune system. So the more you stress, the more you can get sick. So that's a very easy, <laughs> logical thing that, you know, avoid stress. Uh, no, we've, we've used a collaboration tool. Uh, you know, we use Microsoft Teams, Office 365 in the cloud. Uh, so we have uh, channels where we have, you know, coffee breaks every, you know, two or three times a day by team. People just come in with their webcam and just chat and don't talk about work only. Uh, Very cool. I like that idea. Um, and I think communication, transparent communication, uh, making sure that if we have anybody in the environment that doesn't feel well, you know, they're not isolated. We provide them support. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and, and I think taking the long view, obviously uh, setting up, you know, over 6,000 employees to work from home was a little bit stressful, but we also want to make sure that as we set them, we no settled into the, what we call the new normal. Uh, and that not everything is an urgent an emergency now that we have people working from home, and we need to try to go back to business as usual as much as possible uh, to avoid like the the, the peak of stress uh, during the day. So as we we only have like one minute left, but how are you taking care of yourself as an executive? Uh, trying to exercise every day, go outside like today with nice weather, uh, get some fresh air, uh, take a break. Um, and, uh, you know, yep. Try to, uh, try to not watch the news too much, which is hard for me as I'm a news junkie in general. So that's, uh, <laughs> uh, checking on family. I mean, my, uh, my parents are in Europe, uh, my friend, a lot of my friends are in Europe. So checking on, on people, um, you know, across the world is also very important. Um, uh, that's, that's what I do. Well, I want to thank you for your candor, for being available for the leadership role that you've had. And I will make sure that the links for these opportunities for the jobs 
will be posted and shared. Yep. And uh, hopefully we can amass enough resources so that you can continue to thrive and continue appreciate your leadership, even in Butler, PA, for the pivot. It's quite remarkable. So on thank that you. note, I want to thank you. And everyone who's on the call, just stay tuned. We're going to shift to Senator Jay Costa in just one moment. So don't go away. Keep and everyone up. is saying thank you, Francois. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Audrey. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. everybody. Thank you. And I think we have Senator Costa on the line already. Fantastic. Are you with us? Yes, I am, Brian. And Audrey, how are you guys doing? Doing great. Great. We're hoping to see your face in one minute, right? Well, I'm not sure about that. I am not Zoom um, trained or understanding. So I think we just might do the call if that make, works out. Senator Cross is on the phone. Okay. Yeah, so, oh, that's no wonderful. so let me, so let me just tell that to everyone here. And I'm not sure, is everyone seeing Jonathan's face right now? Oh, I can see my face. Uh, I want to make sure, first of all, thank you, Senator Costa. You've joined the call. It's audio. So I appreciate you taking time off the Senate floor to connect with us. And I want to thank the staff. So that's um, deeply appreciated. Yesterday, the General Assembly sent a $50 million recovery package to Governor Wolf for his signature. And you also released the guidelines for the new $60 million small business loan. I know that you have been working day in, day out, and you played a key leadership role in the development of both of these packages. So can we jump in and can you talk about those packages and how they may help some of the businesses on the call today? Absolutely, yes. Thank, thank you very much for the chance to have this conversation. So yesterday we actually passed four measures that we've sent to the governor's desk that he'll probably sign uh, tomorrow. Uh, you referenced the fiscal code amendment, which was allowing for $50 million, up to $50 million to be spent by the uh, governor and Department of Health, the Secretary of Health, uh, on COVID-19 related items. And it has a broad definition along those lines, what they might be. Uh, I think that's what's significant. It takes those resources from various, what are called special funds that we have in our general appropriations uh, through, the, through the state and the governor is able to go in there and figure out where he needs to take funds to be able to accumulate $50 million for the purposes I just discussed. So we expect that that will be um, signed by the governor tomorrow. The other things that we did related to doing work on the, um, uh, something moving the election was one of the big issues that we had to address dealing with that, the primary election timeline. Unemployment compensation legislation we did at the state level that allow for a couple things. One would allow coverage to begin on day one, and then the second piece was waiving the uh, work search requirement. The third thing was holding harmless uh, those entities, the businesses that would have been impacted uh, if folks were seeking unemployment. So there'd be no harm to the employer in that regard with those changes. That coupled with what is being done at the federal level, I think would go a long way in addressing a number of individuals their ability to be able to remain as whole as possible uh, through this crisis. There was some extension of time at the federal level, but uh, that's not complete yet at this point. Uh, the other last piece we did that related to our school code to making sure that we followed up on the things that the governor had already said that we would be doing in the Commonwealth, that would be uh, not requiring a full and complete 180 days for our schools to conduct class. Uh, the hours of training or, or excuse me, hours of instruction was modified, uh, given the Secretary of Education the ability to waive other mandates at the district levels that um, the virus would have caused changes to or necessitated changes. Similarly, by the way, uh, and the same thing with Secretary of Labor and Industry, to be able to incorporate and waive other mandates for employers and the like uh, as it relates to what comes from the federal government, though. So those are the four things we did. Before that, we made changes to the uh, through this Commonwealth Financing Authority, we pulled money from uh, different programs and we've moved it over to the PETA program and it's going to allow them to be able to make, um, make those loans about up to $100,000 uh, for um, and uh, making them low interest or zero interest loans along uh, those lines for a period of time. 
Um, that's, those are the things that were done. The say, CFA authorized that. DCD sent out the regulations, I think, or their applications, I should say, are now live as of yesterday morning. And that's where things are at right now. So one of the questions, Senator, is that the, um, what's available for nonprofits? Any, any capability to talk about that? I think some of the things that are coming from Washington may be more appropriate for nonprofit uh, entities along those lines. We're waiting to see what that actually looks like. Um, it is for, um, this program is primarily for for-profit entities um, going forward, but I do think that there will be programs that we are working on. Senate Democrats, have, we've had a number of calls about ways in which we're going to sort of fill in the gap uh, where organizations or entities or, or businesses who may not be eligible for any of the programs that we know of right now uh, will be able to put those things in place, hopefully, as we go forward. Okay. In, in another question that comes up uh, often, in reviewing both the state and the SBA loans, we're hearing concerns from technology companies that they don't meet the eligibility requirements due to the request for collateral personal guarantees and some provisions that restrict access to companies that have lost money in, in recent years. This captures quite a few of our investor-backed companies who have all been cut off from you know, what's happened now with angel and venture capital investing and investors. Are you hearing similar concerns and do you foresee the ability to tweak some of the program guidelines as these issues emerge and these gaps emerge? I, I have, I've heard one or two concerns that have been raised. Um, my conversations with our congressional delega delegation, specifically Congressman Doyle, uh, who couldn't comment definitively at this point on that um, particular piece. Audrey, I wish I had a specific answer for you, but That's I don't. Fine. That's fine. I'm um, just trying to not put you on the spot. I know that you're working hard and you're doing you know, um, amazing work. I just want you to hear some of the things that people are asking. No, and I, and I think that, I mean, I believe that these, as I understand the passage of the other, at least two versions that have come forward and, and this more recent one coming, I think that it's intended to be as flexible as possible. I know at the state level, we are authorizing our folks, our secretaries to have the ability to delegate to them the authority to be flexible and make decisions without having to come back nor the new more, the, through the normal uh, regulatory uh, process changes that take place to the bureaucracy, so to speak. Um, so we think that that's gonna be helpful along those lines. This is all still very fluid, both at the federal and state level. I intend, we anticipate that we'll be coming back to work uh, to do more, uh, but we wanted to give some authority to the, to the secretaries for this period of time to make those type of flexible decisions. Okay, and then also the deadline for filing state tax returns has been moved, is that correct? The move to uh, July 15th, and, and the call I just came off of with the governor, uh, it's had a significant, it's gonna have a significant impact on our revenues for this year. Um, for, at this point, we're down about $400 million in our collection, and we only have about three or four days of collections left, and as you know, um, revenues, you know, we'll probably have, it'll probably wipe out the $250 million sur uh, surplus that we had built up at this point that accumulated. So, and then we certainly know that April is going to be a very bad month for us, knowing that we've moved it from April 15th to July 15th. So, uh, we are heading in a course where we're going to have some very serious revenue challenges. Yes, that's, that's what I heard. And then what, um, also, Senator Brewster called for a discussion to begin on broad state stimulus plan for job preservation. Right. That's what I was referencing. Between Senator Brewster and our caucus, we're developing some of the things that we think um, would be beneficial for our, um, you know, for our business, certainly our business community, but also for our workers and what needs to be done along those lines. And just the idea that we want to be, make sure that we don't leave anyone behind. And that's really the biggest issue that we're looking at right now. Our, our, I, we just sent a, a um, we just sent a, a letter last week, earlier this week, maybe Tuesday or Wednesday, to Speaker Pelosi and and the Democrats, because the Democratic Caucus wrote it, asking them to consider a variety of uh, measures as part of what they're doing there, and also what we're going to be able to do. 
But we're looking at everything from, you know, looking at some dead things to be able to address some stuff, looking back what we did back with Governor Rendell when we did the economic stimulus package in Pennsylvania, how we had pockets of money for whether it be uh, in the energy environment or energy community, uh, the environmental community, I should say, uh, transportation infrastructure was going to be part of that, how we're going to work to do things in that area. Also, some emergency relief for not only individuals, certainly, but for small business, loan guarantees, et cetera, business interruption insurance, addressing all the things that may get lost or missed through this process. So uh, we're going to be coming out very soon with our package of measures along those lines to be able to help folks in the various sectors, but also um, you know, sort of policy things as well that I think are going to be important. So what else do you think is really important for everyone to know right now? Because with the, we have resources that we're going to be linking everyone to, most of which you've made reference to. Um, there's CEDO offices that can help with the process, et cetera. What else um, do you want us to know? Well, a couple things. One, um, we'll know more definitively probably Friday, I think, is when the U.S. Congress is coming back, or the House of Representatives coming back to past that. We have a pretty good idea of what's in there. Now we are matching it up with what we know, we, with programs we have, and what we can do to build upon that. So we ask folks uh, to have some patience. If they have ideas about things that we should be looking at as a commonwealth that we can do that um, makes sense and would help an industry or a sector, uh, we should let us know, let me know that. Uh, what I've offered to folks uh, today, I sent out a you know, message to folks, uh, small businesses, that they have any interest or need some help navigating through um, this, uh, this time, particularly through, the, uh, through PETA and DCED, that they can contact us. I've assigned uh, Martel Covington from my staff to be a point uh, of contact for folks to help walk them through the application process or, or walk them any, through any other type of programming needs that they would have. We're doing that in conjunction with Congressman Mike Doyle, so between the two of us, uh, if a business has an interest or have an issue that they want to address or seeking a loan or whatever the case might be, um, if they need our assistance, we're here to work with them and help them navigate and walk through that. But the bigger thing is, is that um, this is going to be a long-term uh, situation that we're going to have to deal with. And as we hear more about what the feds are going to be doing on the, on the employee side, very much concerned about employees as well. Certainly we're concerned about the viability of businesses through this crisis and hopefully they come out on the, on the, on the back end of this, but also have to look at some of the things that we need to do to help work with our, our employees and the like. So uh, what I read this morning on the federal stimulus package for uh, employers seemed to be positive to me uh, in many ways and uh, what we're trying to do at the state level to assist as well. And I think that's what we're, we need to address. Whatever we can do to keep our employees paid and working to maintain, um, on, so when we come out of this, they're still there ready to go to work, as well as helping in other ways. That's what we need to do. But uh, I'm happy to hear from folks about ideas they might have that we could do things and be happy to entertain those and bring them to, to the front office and to our leadership in Harrisburg. Well, that's, that's excellent. I think uh, one last thing, Senator, in the world that we we are very lucky to represent but right now there are many companies who have a life of you know less than a year or 18 months and they've been venture backed so there's some questioning about their eligibility in, in terms of these incentives and the stimulus has, has been released do you have any sense of that or is that something that should be directed to dcg and other offices I, I think, in, well, as it relates to the state, I will investigate that, and I will certainly weigh in, and I believe we gave the DCD secretary some, some latitude to, to do some things, and I'll double back with that. I had a conversation with Secretary Davin this morning on, on this waiver conversation uh, that's been pretty crazy, but um, at the federal level, I'm not quite sure what the SBA is, how they're going to handle the, the very specific eligibility with respect to how folks are positioned or situated, uh, particularly those short-term uh, entities so or enterprises. So I, um, I will double back with the congressman. I will tell you, he and I are working to do a, um, we're going to be doing a telephone town hall on Thursday, I think in a week from today, Thursday. He's going to have a person from the Small Business Administration on the call with us. I'm going to have um, 
somebody from the Labor and Industry Unemployment Bureau, uh, the head of that, either the secretary or the head of the Unemployment Compensation Bureau. We're going to have a what's called a telephone town hall, so uh, geared towards small businesses and, and, and entities. If they have questions, uh, we will be able to get those answers directly. But in the meantime, they can email me those questions, um, and I will get them to Congress's office or to SBA folks and get an answer. Okay, that's excellent. And we'll make sure everyone knows how to reach out to you. So many businesses in manufacturing are in the gray area for the shutdown, like contract manufacturers, but they're key suppliers to essential companies. Um, what, what about them? Can they, should they be applying for a waiver? Uh, if they are, yes. I think if they are part of the supply chain as it relates to an essential operation that has been permitted to operate, then I believe that they A, would be eligible, and B, uh, they should certainly seek a waiver and really make a strong case that how they fit into the supply chain vis-a-vis -vis the COVID-19 uh, virus situation. So, yes, I think they should apply and, um, and go from there. I do think that um, if they're in the supply chain and can make a legitimate argument that they're there uh, and demonstrate that, I think that they would be fine and they should be okay, but they should apply. Okay. So in, in wrap up in summation, contact your office directly, open yeah, I, ideas, take advantage and submit for all waivers, reach out to the CEDAW offices, come up with uh, any kind of recommendations that would be helpful to you. Stay tuned for your opening, for your meeting that you're holding next week. Is there right. anything else, Senator? No, just feel free to give me a holler or argue, work through you. And yeah. then you can reach out to me and assemble a bunch of different ideas if you want, or even issues. But right. uh, right. take advantage of our opportunity for us to work with you to help navigate through through this bureaucracy, both at the state and federal level. Yeah, you are um, doing amazing work. We appreciate your leadership. If we haven't said that enough, oh, thank, thank you, you for of you. the time with us. Yep. And appreciate your openness, as always. And what I want to tell everyone who's on the call, that again, I just want to give thanks to Huntington Bank and to AT&T for supporting us, and that tomorrow we will be hosting the Chief of Staff to Mayor Bill Peduto, Dan Gilman, and then we're going to go in overtime with the second guest with the state's release of the guidelines for the $60 million small business loan funds because people have lots of questions and we're gonna go live with the team from RIDC, which is one of the organizations processing the applications in the new program. I know it's gonna be informative. So we are definitely looking at all this and working on your behalf round the clock. I can't thank all of you enough for tuning in and give us feedback as well. We are here working on all of your behalf. So thank you and until tomorrow at noon. Thank Stuff you, Audrey. Happened. Appreciate it. Thank you.